sometimes the answer that you're looking for is there right in front of you. It's been there all the time, maybe. Jazz Chisholm Jr. is the new center fielder for the Miami Marlins. Right now, anyway, heading into 2023. Um, big news there. Orias, according to Kim Ang, will be the starting second baseman. Jazz Chisholm sliding out to center field. Never played center field ever before, other than probably, I don't know, when he was 14. So we'll see how this all goes. So immediate reaction to Jazz to center field, Orias to second base. Also, rumors continue to circle. Guriel to the Marlins. Is it going to happen? We'll wait and see. What could the knock-on effects be if, you, if Yuli Guriel is signed by the Marlins? Digging into everything on Monday's episode, 23rd of Jan, with the UK GOAT, Sean Barrett. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked on Marlins. This, of course, is your daily Marlins podcast. I'm your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up, of course, on Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore UK. And if you are listening to the pod, greetings, welcome. Happy Monday, everyone. Uh, hit subscribe, leave a review, why not? And yes, there is a YouTube channel. And yes, it is called Locked on Marlins. And yes, we are live. And Sean Barrett, as I mentioned, is in the house. Sean Barrett, how are we doing, brother? I'm doing well, Pete. I had a bit of... Uh... Bit of a disappointment last week, missing the uh, the Friday pod with you, but um, unfortunately I can't be available every week in second. I try. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. You know, you were my first call. Uh, I know a lot of people made uh, the show their first listen of the day, see what I did there, but you were the first call. Unfortunately, you were already out and about uh, celebrating how we typically do uh, in the UK after work, and, you know, it was what it was. Uh, I had to fly solo. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. All of a sudden, that came quick. And actually, yeah, let's let's get your take on it, mate. You know, Luis Arias, Pablo Lopez, big deal going down. Um, and what I'd say is, you know, it, it it's I've I've taken time to sit and dwell and think about it now. Like when I recorded on Friday, it just it happened quickly. It felt like it happened quickly. Um, deal was done, um, and I've taken a lot of time to think about it now. But what was your a immediate reaction and B? Has anything changed subsequently? Uh, my immediate reaction was, "What awful timing this is!" Um, the, the trade, <laughs> the trade that had to happen, the, yeah. the, the trading of a pitcher for a hitter that had to happen. Um, you know, there was a lot of buzz and and, and uh, opinions going out immediately um, about you know, the Marlins. Have the Marlins won the trade? Have they lost the trade? Uh, at, at a certain degree. I'm not bothered by that. It is no. a case of we knew this trade had to happen. Um, and as it is, Arias is actually a really interesting bat for me. Mm. Um, a, a continuation of the theme of the offseason of bringing in high contact guys mm. and, and guys that are going to, we, we are going to, I think you said um, death by a, a million paper cuts. I think that's the perfect analogy. It is a case of with the new rules in baseball now with the, the shift going there's going to be more contact. There's going to be more hits in baseball. Mm. Um, and, and the Marlins need to get away. How often have I said about a guy in, in, on the Marlins who strikes out too much and doesn't walk enough? And it, and it's painful. And and Skip, coming from the the Cardinals, has that, that sort of ethos in him as well, I believe. The Cardinals are always that team that just keep racking up hit after hit after hit. And and this is what I think the Marlins are now creating a mould in the Cardinals' way. And I think that Arias is a perfect fit for this. I have mm. a, a friend who I've known for years. He's a Minnesota Twins fan. I asked him just his immediate reaction on, on, on Arias and what he is. And he said he's a hitting savant. And that's oh. all I needed to hear. Oh, baby. Baby, that is it. Um, you know, now, now we're starting to get a bit more information too. Like, clearly... Arias is going to be leading off here for the fish. I mean, the profile absolutely fits that perfectly. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz last year about Jazz Chisholm Jr. And, you know, he was in, in the nine hole or in the eight hole early doors. You know, we want him leading off. Jazz's profile isn't of a leadoff hitter. And 
Uh, actually, this maybe frees Jazz up. We'll kind of talk about the defensive ramifications, but really, Arias' profile is absolutely wonderful at the top of the lineup there. It's just what you need. You need a guy on base and then just let it happen there. So, you know, for me, the Marlins haven't had, I guess, a leadoff guy in many ways for, for a long time. I can't actually remember, you know, the, <laughs> the the last time they had someone that, like, truly fit the profile as a uh, as a leadoff hitter. I mean, like, I think back to the early days of my Marlins fandom when D. Gordon um, was leading off, and that was, you know, the, the year when Stanton went on his crazy run. He was in the two-hole. It was like D would lead off. Stanton would just come up and smash a homer. Next thing is 2-0 Marlins. Let's go. No pitching to back it up, but, you know, was what it was. Um, perfect guy, though, to be leading off, though, right? The profile fits perfectly, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun seeing him in that number one spot. Yeah, he's he's a perfect example of a modern day leadoff here. Yeah. Um, for for years, it was a case of you just ch chucked your fastest guy on, on the team in the leadoff spot, and and you didn't care about how often he'd get on base. And one of the most valuable, literally the most valuable thing you can do as a leadoff here is get on base. Yeah, the the the, the numbers of the inning change significantly. Obviously, that's common sense. And yet, for years, teams didn't run baseball like that. They just put the quick guy on because they can. They knew that when he got on, he could quickly get moved over to second. Yeah. Uh, and the Marlins did that for yeah, as you said, for years with Juan Pierre and, and D. Gordon and various other players. Arias is an on-base machine. Most of that comes from hits, but he does also walk up a fair amount as well. Um, and when you match that with the low K rate, it's it, the, the numbers are, are glorious. I think. People that are concerned about his power, I don't care. He's a leadoff hitter. He mm. actually does pop in a bit of power. And actually, bizarrely, um, Target Field in uh, Minnesota, it's actually a worse batting environment for left-handed hitters than, than Lone Depot Park is. Oh, wow. So actually, his his home run numbers would be inflated marginally. Um, yeah. Uh, in Miami, so that's something. He is a gap hitter. He is a doubles hitter. Mm. Um, I think if you if you factor in the home runs and the doubles, and I think he got a couple of triples. He actually had more extra base hits than nearly every player on the Marlins last year. Just Coop was ahead of him. Now, yes, Jazz only had half a season, and so did Soler. So that factored yeah. in. But the point is, when people look at the home run totals and say, "Oh, he doesn't hit for power," firstly, I don't care. He's a leadoff yeah. hitter. And secondly, those doubles, I mean, in, in that vast field that they're going to be playing in, 40 doubles is a, a really achievable number. And that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like the Marlins were like in on Arias early. It feels like, or the, the, the feeling was that like they identified him, they wanted him, uh, and they they you know wanted to get a deal done. The interesting bit, you know, with, with teams... This is why maybe a Pablo trade was a tricky one. We spoke about it back at the deadline too. You know, the Marlins weren't looking for a prospect package. And so their, their trade partners were relatively limited because you you have to find guys that are going to trade, um, you know, good hitters from their, their major league roster. And often teams don't have a, a glut of, of talent. But for the Twins, they, they kind of did here where they've got a few guys in, in it first base and obviously the Correa um, D then took them to that level but the Marlins seemingly had to um, you know go well not seemingly they had to go beyond Pablo Lopez they had to add to that with two prospects um, Salas being you know the big name in there what was your take on the fact that Salas was included I guess that was the point you're making about is this an overpay for the Marlins and you know by kind of every trade value calculator out there right now it will look like an overpay but the reality was the Marlins They've seen a guy they wanted. Pablo Lopez alone wasn't going to get it done. They had to add to it to get it done. So you feel comfortable with that? Yeah. I mean, at a certain point um, when we're talking about a, a winning window of that they're trying to, come to, to create, essentially. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you can't hold on to these prospects forever. Um, I think, bizarrely, the Marlins have got a pretty decent stash of middling field prospects. So they're probably... Yeah, they they're, they're trading from an area of relative depth compared to everywhere else. And, yeah. and for me, for a trade that had to happen, we needed to bring in a guy. You know, we wanted a centre fielder. We wanted a lead-off guy. 
we've kind of got that by proxy. If you do move Jazz into centre field, and he yeah. is definitely the contact on base kind of guy that is a lead off hitter. Um, I'm not too worried about him, him having no speed. No, no, absolutely. Just do your thing, Louis, and the rest will happen around you, I think. Um, yeah, to your point there, and I, I think this isn't just the Marlins window, and I think this is probably the critical point that I've kind of thought about it even more. This is Kim Ang's window, and she's in a contract year. Let's let's not forget about that. And at the end of the day, this is Kim's call at the end of it. And Jose Salas is not going to be helping Kim Ang this year. Absolutely not. Pablo Lopez would have done, but they needed to get a stick in there. They have to get a stick in there. And Kim Ang, you know, it, she has to make this deal happen. And it's it's Jose Salas added in there to get the stick that they absolutely needed. And so this is critical to her. This year is her window because she can't hang her hat on the last two years. The, the amount of losses is just insane. The Marlins need to take a big step forward here. Otherwise, Kim Ang is really under pressure. Um, maybe rightly so, maybe wrongly so. I don't know. But it felt like, you know, the, the, the trigger had to be pulled. And I think they pulled the trigger on a very interesting player that I think absolutely fits what the Marlins needed. Yes, it's tough, you know, very tough to lose Pablo, but to go and get a stud hitter that's just proven, that there's no other way of phrasing it with the Riots. Like, he's just proven he does what he does. And to go and get him, yes, you give your, you know, your, your, one of your stud arms away, but that was always the plan. That is what it is. Um, and we move on. We're going to talk about the impact to Jazz Chisholm Jr. after the break. Uh, and we also wanted to touch on the rumors, the rumors that circle around Guriel and what the impact will be on that one. So um, stay with us uh, until after the break. And guys, for those, it's a new ad, brand new ad partner. FanDuel is in the house now, guys. So uh, delighted to get into this one. Let's see if I can uh, not botch it along the way. We'll see. We'll see how I do. But um <laughs> Uh, the N well, the N they are here. They're absolutely plowed through. It's been a fun weekend of action. I watched pretty much all of the games. I'm excited about the new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're at the number one sports book in America. It's FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Sounds good to me. New customers join today to get started with $150 in free bets. Guaranteed. When you place your first $5 bet, sounds like an amazing deal. All you have to do is sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on. Let me go back and just tell you that again. New customers, join today and get started with $150 in free bets, guaranteed. Oh boy, that sounds sensational. All you have to do is place your first $5 bet. Fanduel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. Absolutely loaded. You can even combine your bets for a chance to get a bigger payout with same game parlay. I've seen a lot of them flying around over the weekend. Um, all you know, first touchdown score is going below galore. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, all on the app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Um, football fans, don't miss out. Reminder now on this offer: five dollar bet to get one hundred and fifty dollars in free bets, win or lose at fanduelcom slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Oh, baby. It's big time. Big time. Right. Speaking about big time, Sean, talk to me now about this news that Jazz Chisholm Jr. will be transitioning into center field for 2023. Uh, we've seen some of the smoke that Jazz has put out there, which is great to hear that he's going to go and win a gold glove out in the center field. Uh, Michael Harris, uh, you know, had the eyes emoji flying in on that one. But how big of a risk is this for the Marlins, putting Jazz out in center field, having effectively never played any pro ball out there at all? I mean, it certainly is a, is a risky option, isn't it? I mean, the Marlins are trying to put, what, four second basemen on the field at one time. It's an interesting strategy, that's for it sure. It is, it is. Um, look, Jazz, Jazz is young and, and he's got the athleticism and he clearly is willing to be the guy that can do anything. And I think he can. I think physically he can. Um, I have some concerns. I think to a certain degree, you're putting a lot on his plate. Yeah. 
it's a case of he's he's carrying the team um, not just on the field but being that face of the franchise as well. That 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 it's not that big of a deal in the sense of taking up time, but it certainly does to a degree. Um, he's expected to be healthy. He's expected to play a position he's never played before. He's expected to lead the team offensively. And for me, can he do it? Yes, of course he can. But it's a case of how much pressure do you want to put on such young shoulders? Yeah. Um, the, the, the less that the Marlins require from him, the better the team's going to be. Um, so, he has all the talent in the world, and I, and I don't want to put any uh, dampeners on what he can and can't do. But it is that case of we've seen before, you know, with Brinson, you know, he was he was supposed to lead the team into this new era, and it was too much pressure, um, far mm-hmm. too much pressure for a, a young guy like that. Um, I think Brinson and Jazz are two completely different people. But my point remains: how much do you expect to put on one person? Yeah. Um, and just adding center. I mean, adding center field to a player who's only just really settled and learned to play second base. I mean, 2021, yeah. he was sort of in and out of second and short. There were a hell of a lot of errors, hell of a lot. Mm-hmm. And if you look at his 20, if you look at his numbers last year, not much changed. It's not like he increased his range or his arm got any better because they're not going to at this point. What he did defensively was limit those errors really yeah. knuckle down and, and got rid of it's only 60 games admittedly but if you extend those numbers across a full season he was a far better defender at second base um and for me it's it's a shame that the Marlins haven't gone and, and fixed center field properly um but it's certainly going to be if it if it remains if it if this is what the Marlins actually do do um, it will certainly be interesting, that's for sure. It certainly will. Uh, you segued me to exactly the point I was thinking about in my mind is, do you think this is real? Uh-huh. I know that you've had a presser, and the presser is, hey, here's our brand new guy, Luis Arias. Uh, the quite natural question is, Kim, where's he going to play? And she said second base. And then naturally the question is, well, what about Jazz? <laughs> probably expecting the answer to be, yeah, we're going to slide Jazz over to shortstop. I can imagine that is what everyone in that presser was thinking. So then to drop the center field bomb was interesting. But is it smoke? Is it real? Could it be negotiation tactics? Because I think the problem the Marlins have had negotiating some deals for center fielders for the last two and a half off seasons, or two and a half years, sorry, is the fact that everyone knows they've got a huge need there and they're looking for a huge overpay. Um, maybe the, maybe this is a negotiation tactic where they're saying we've got our center fielder now. And all of a sudden, you know, teams looking to sell, you know, Ramon Laureano, for example, are going, uh oh, our market's dried up. <laughs> We're going to have to roll with Ramon. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it, double thinking it, but it is possible that this is all a bit of a smokescreen and, uh, Jazz maybe will slide into shortstop and, and they'll go and get a center fielder. I don't know. Where's, where's your head at on that? Uh, when it when it comes to baseball trades, I do like a good conspiracy theory. So There's nothing like it, is it? I think I think that's, that's it's a valid point, and I think it is something that you you can't rule out. It is a case of uh, Kim can say to a team, "Look, we're happy with where we are at the moment, with the way the team's built. We're happy. Come June, July, if we're in it, then then maybe we'll trade for a, a genuine centre fielder and add that back to the lineup." Mm. As it is, we don't need to. We're happy where we are. That would certainly put the onus on the other team if they are then in need of doing that. This trade more than the Marlins. Yeah, it could be a negotiation tactic. And for me, I think that that would be. I I, I wish that is the case. Yeah. I think. I think an, an, one more bat, a, along with Yuli or an, a different uh, aging first baseman, just because. You do need that little bit of depth. I think those two more bats, and <laughs> crazy, isn't it, that with all these additions that the Marlins have made, and we're still asking for two more bats. Um, it's probably a it sign stands, of uh, the quality of the offense last year, I think, though, by the way. Yeah. As it stands, if the Marlins rolled into the new season, adding just Yuli and one or two 
bullpen pieces, and we're talking real low level bullpen pieces. I think I'm there now. I think I'm there in the idea of I will have an optimistic 500 ball level expectations for the Marlins for the new season. Well, if you've got 500 ball penciled in, I've got 95 wins then. That's <laughs> that's probably where we're up to. <laughs> um, I Just overall, like my the, the thing about the jazz and center field thing, as soon as I heard the news, I was excited. I'm excited to see because, I, you know, we're all, well, you know what jazz is as an athlete and you know that the tools are there to be able to handle the job given the right amount of practice and training and, you know, the stuff like, so jazz has got to buy into it because he's, you know, he's going to have to learn this new position. That's, you know, perhaps the second or third most important defensive position uh, whilst, keeping your stick rolling and doing the things that you do. Like we saw it last year with Jesus Sanchez. It was too much. It was too much for him trying to learn a new position and concentrate on his hitting. And it was to the, to the detriment of Jesus Sanchez. And we don't want the same to happen with Jazz Chisholm Jr. Absolutely not. But I'm excited to see it. Um, I'm more excited about it than anyone else that's currently on the roster. It does solve a problem because we currently have five second basemen. So, Jazz needs to go and play somewhere else. Um, where, how this ends, I don't know. I still would like the Marlins to address center field properly. And it feels like this is a stopgap right now. It feels like this isn't what Jazz wants to do long term. He'll do it. He's putting his hand up to say, I will do it. But I don't think it's a long term solution. And I, I hope it, I mean, he may become an elite center fielder. Gut feel is there's likely to be significant growing pains. And what we really don't want to see is actual pains. Where their situation for the Twins last year, they have him in center field or in the outfield. The next thing is he lands awkwardly against the wall and torn ACL. Same, you know, same kind of vibe as what Acuna had. That is absolutely not what the Marlins need to see, guy on the team. He's the face of the franchise. And in some ways, you need to kind of protect him. Um, but there's a need. He automatically is the best center fielder on the team just by the tools. <laughs> so we'll wait and see how it plays out. I do. It would not shock me if this is all smoke and mirrors from Kim, Kim Ang, to be honest with you, though. Not, you know, what did we see, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, Miguel Rojas, he's going to be our backup first baseman. A day later, Miggy gone. Um you know, we asked about someone else then after. Uh, what about Heyrar Encarnacion? And we'll segue into this now, but gut feel is Encarnacion, I think, will be gone when, when if Guriel is signed. And everyone's going, whoa, hold on a minute. You know, Guriel, you know, Encarnacion can just go down into AAA, which makes sense. But the problem is, Guriel, you need to get a 40 man spot. <laughs> you you got to clear another dude. And we're already kind of churning into the guys. And for me, Encarnacion is absolutely on the bubble. I know, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll come to you now, Sean, on this as well. My take on, on Encarnacion, when he hit a salami in his, what, his first ever home run, it was a, it was a salami. The next day, he was optioned. To me, that said, the Marlins do not, they don't care about Encarnacion and he is not part of the plans. He didn't take any reps at first base last year when they could have had him at first base easily. He didn't do it. A bit like what Craig Mish was saying about Charles LeBlanc, the Marlins aren't in on him. For me, everything they've shown me about Encarnacion has said they're not in on Encarnacion and the roster crunch is going to come here when, if they sign Guriel. And I think Encarnacion will be DFA'd. That's my gut feel on it. But not to start with a negative, Guriel. As a, as, a, as a backup guy, where's your head at with this one? It feels like this is going to happen. Keep checking my phone every 10 minutes just to make sure it doesn't happen live on this show. But the Marlins definitely have a need for a backup first baseman. Um, I'm not convinced that Guriel's profile completely fits that, though. Like, I, I mean, he's been a, an everyday starter for the Astros for the last seven years. Is he going to come to Miami to be a backup first baseman? I don't know. Where's your head at with this one? I think there'll be enough at bats for Guriel. I think it is a case of yeah, at his his stage of his career, he just wants to play, and that's a 
it's a perfectly reasonable thing to, to want to do. Um, and the fact that he wants to play over going back to a team that uh, have genuine playoff aspirations is is kind of interesting. Uh, for me, he is the yeah he's a prototypical guy for the, the the new movement of the Marlins, a high contact guy. Um, last year, I mean, he was atrocious. Um, <laughs> if you look at it, he's he's a nigh on three hundred hitter for his career. Yeah, two poor years that he's had. Um, the the Babip are, are criminally low. So, is there a chance that he was just unlucky? Um, You'd hope so. If the Marlins sign him, you'd hope so. Um, I think he brings he brings a lefty bat. He can hit lefties, um, as can Coop. Um, Coop for his career has hit lefties as well. So I think it's not a case of he'll just see all of his plate appearances at left or take all of them from Coop, I should say. I think there'll be some mixing and matching. Um, there are always enough at bats. We, we talked last off-season about how the, the team had added depth to the team. And yeah. that was one of the main things that kind of had us excited for the season. And as it was, that depth was severely tested very quickly. Um, so I think this is just an, another reinforcement for the team that's needed. And Hayra, unfortunately, is a casualty of the old regime. Of mm. They wanted to uh, say old regime. It's still the same regime. It's just a different approach. They were bringing in toolsy guys guys with power and speed and, and not much baseball ability and yeah. hoped that they could teach them these great athletes the game of baseball. It didn't work. It can work, but for the Marlins in this instance, it didn't work. So what no. they're now doing is they're bringing in these high high floor, low ceiling guys that you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a high average, but with not much power, not much speed. Um, and you, you can win baseball games with that kind of approach and, and, I think Guriel is yeah a prototypical guy for that that movement. Yeah, agreed. I, I think that's a really important piece. Is just Encarnacion's profile is that of you know a strategy from a few years ago. I'm going to put him in the the, the bracket of the big boys, and the big boys got to go. Um, and you know he fits that profile. They just had too many of the same guy, and all of which were doing exactly the same things, which was swing and miss, strike out, no walks, no bombs no hits, and uh, just a ton of losses for the Marlins. So it's a clear directional change. Uh, I think Encarnacion uh, will be the, the most likely candidate to be DFA. Uh, all teams may like you know what they've seen. I don't know, but you know he's had a nice winter. But for me, everything I've seen from what the Marlins have done and how they've handled him, similar in many, in some ways to Lewin Diaz, not quite as extreme as that, but um, just their their hand living in has, has felt like he's a depth guy now and they, they've kind of moved on from that. So we'll wait and see on, on that. I feel like this, the signing is close and imminent. The rumours are that there's been at least two meetings uh, between uh, the Marlins and, and Guriel. Not clear if they've uh, put a contract out, but gut feel is they have. That seems to be what's reported. A lot of buzz picking up. The interesting bit is the Twins reaching out. And I think that is an interesting fit though. Clearly they move Arias that spent, you know, the most of the year at first base, you know, could they be 4D chessing it going again in Pablo Lopez, um, a nice prospect, and then just replacing uh, the first base gap with effectively an older version of Arias, um, <laughs> which is kind of what Yuri Gurriel is. So very intrigued to see the way this plays out. I think Gurriel, in terms of his profile, is, it, it's very much akin to what they're trying to do right now. And they're on a buy low situation. So I think if the Marlins can get this deal done, um, I think it'll be a good deal. I initially was a little bit pessimistic on this, but uh, the, the direction of the organization has just emerged in the last week or so. We can just see everything what's happening now. Death by a million paper cuts. So it's, it's an approach and you just have to buy into this strategy and look to deliver it. But Kim Ang needs wins. She's absolutely, you know, the Marlins cannot lose, you know, 100 games, 95 games, 90 games. They just can't do that again because, you know, that's that's going to be not a, a it's going to be an uncomfortable spot for Kim. So, um, Sean, we're at the 30 minute mark. We're bang out of time. Uh, we've covered, I'd say it all in the last for over the weekend. There's been a lot of Marlins news, mate. I'm going to just ask you one question before we get out of here. 
and thinking about it from a war perspective. I know you're a war guy. Now Arias is in the building. Who do you see being the 2023 hitting war leader for the Marlins? <laughs> you know I want to say Garrett Cooper. It's um You can say Garrett Cooper. Uh it's it's jazz. It's gotta be jazz. If he plays center field, I mean mm. that that will have a big impact on it. Um if you want to go to WRC plus, then I think Coop's got a better chance. Um but it's it's between yeah, it's between Jazz and Arias. Um at the moment. I mean, we'll see how it goes. I mean, Solaire could just have a crazy year. I mean, there's it's crazy, isn't it, that I have now a lot of optimism or oh, a lot of optimism for me. <laughs> I like the way you checked yourself, you fact checked yourself on that one. Just you know, for me, put it into context. So I'm with you, mate. I mean, this is Jazz's team now. And I think if Jazz is healthy, um, you know, it'd be interesting. Next time we speak, think about and dwell on your power rankings of center fielders. I put mine out there on Twitter, and it's fair to say there was a little bit of tongue-in-cheek in that. There was actually a lot of tongue-in-cheek in that. Some people missed the joke, which kind of happens on Twitter, right? But um, I do think it's an interesting conversation. If, if Jazz can play average to above average defense and with his offensive profile, where is Jazz Chisholm Jr. going to sit in the overall center field rankings in the NL or in Major League Baseball? I'm very intrigued by that. Let's talk about it next time. Guys, we're bang out of time. Thanks for making Locked on Marlins your first listener of the day. It's the Monday episode. You know Locked on Marlins will be there if news drops. And if news drops in the next hour before I fall asleep, link to Guriel, you know there'll be an emergency pod. If, if not, it'll be in the morning. Other than that, we'll be back very, very soon. Of course, we're Locked on Marlins. Thanks to the UK GOAT, Sean Barrett, for joining me. It's Peter Pratt, Sean Barrett, signing out. See you soon.